G'day folks and welcome to a check on chain update for the 6th of May. So today we're looking at the Bitcoin multiplier effect and really the rationale behind this is there's been some some fairly funny numbers floating around, you know, 100x multipliers, 118x multipliers. Some analysts are basically saying that for every dollar that goes in, we get about $100 plus change in the Bitcoin market cap. And to me, that just didn't quite resonate. I couldn't quite get myself to come to similar numbers. Some quick back of the envelope calculation said this doesn't really pass the smell test. Uh, so what I did is I actually built up a couple of tools to really help us track these things. And what I found was quite interesting. You can actually see a trace of this one on this cover slide here. Um, really looking at periods of supply shortage during bull markets and periods of supply overhang. So really, not only can we estimate the actual multiplier effect and get some pretty reasonable demand estimates for this, we can also actually build an oscillator that tells us when the market is undergoing some kind of a regime shift, which can obviously be quite, uh, quite useful moving forward. So where I want to start is actually with the original estimate. Now, it, was, it wasn't directly quoted 118x, but we do have to do some quick back of the envelope calculation. This was from a report that Bank of America, to be fair, issued on the 17th of March, 2021. So uh, a report issued at the bull market top of the last cycle. And what the claim was is that we estimate a net inflow of, into Bitcoin of 93 million would result in a price appreciation of 1%. Now, at the time, the Bitcoin market cap was about $1.1 trillion, which if we take 1% of that is $10.9 billion. So what that's suggesting is that a $93 million capital inflow would produce a $10.97 billion change in the market cap. And if we just do some quick back of the envelope math, we get 118x. Now, this is a fairly substantial number, right? This would really, and, and to me, there's a few things that stood out. The first thing is that it's big. The second thing is that it surely can't be static, right? I mean, it, at what point in time? So generally speaking, this number didn't quite gel with our initial framework. So what I wanted to do is actually dive in and look at a different, couple of different case studies, a couple of different calculation methods, and see if we can actually arrive at something that, that makes a lot more sense than 118x um, and really just put some, some ballpark numbers to these things. We're not trying to get it to the exact cent, but we are trying to get something that's just a little bit more reasonable than what we think is here. So we'll cover those back of the envelope calcs. Um, I want to put the ETFs in a perspective because as a little small microcosm of the world, um, those numbers can actually tell us a bit of a ballpark of where we're going. Now, just as a bit of a, a refresher, this is going to be part one of the video. As we move into part two, we'll actually look at how we build this into a capital multiplier effect and really understand it as a bit of an oscillator and see how it changes over time because those dynamics uh, can also be quite important. So for those who are watching our channel on YouTube, please do give us a like, a share, and a subscribe. It does help this channel get to more people. Uh, if you are enjoying this content, let us know what you like. Let us know if you have any questions in the comment section below. Um, and don't forget to check out our sub stack over there at checkonchain.com. So, so without further ado, let's get stuck in right into the analysis. Okay, so starting with the ETFs. And the reason I want to start here is that uh, I actually want to start small. And strangely enough, the ETFs are one of the smaller components in the overall mix of things in the world of Bitcoin. Um, this is another one of those narratives that doesn't quite hold up to scrutiny is that the ETFs are driving everything. Um, and by our calculations, they are important, but not the be all and end all. Now, if we're looking at capital inflows, it doesn't really make sense to look at the, the AUM, right? How big the ETFs are, because they are also, that's essentially the equivalent of the market cap of the ETFs. What we actually care about is the dollar value invested, because if you buy a coin at 10,000, you just hold it from that point onwards, then you invested $10,000 times the coin value. The ETFs are much the same. So what we're looking at here is the cumulative amount that was invested, the net inflows or outflows in the case of GBTC, how much capital has actually gone in, not what it's worth, how much has gone into the ETFs. So if we put some numbers to all of this, we've got GBTC down here, which is a 17.5 billion outflow. If we pretend that GBTC doesn't exist, then we've got 29.4 billion in total inflows to the ETFs. But of course, when we net those against each other, we end up with a net flow of about 12 billion. So the ETFs have had about 12 billion in net inflows coming into them. And their AUM right now is just a little bit shy of about 60 billion. So if we take those numbers just as a microcosm of what's going on, We've got 12 billion in inflows. We've got about 60 billion. We're talking about an overall multiplier of about 5x. That means that the 12 billion of inflows is supporting a market cap of about 
60 billion, right? We're in the ballpark of about 5x. That's quite some distance away from 118. Now, granted, the ETFs are just one microcosm, but it's certainly one point that we can, you know, investigate just a little bit further. Now, if we think about what the impact is, let's just imagine the ETFs, right? Let, let's go down the path of the Twitter narrative. The ETFs are the ones driving price. They are the thing that matters right now, um, and everything else is kind of secondary and very small. Well, if that's the case, then we've got our 29 billion, or actually more correctly, our 12 billion of net inflows into the ETFs. And that has, since they went live, somehow produced a 400 or 395 billion increase in the market cap. Right, these are some pretty spectacular numbers, right? 12 billion um, coming up to about 400 billion. So in that instance, we're talking about something on the order of about a 33 or 32x multiple if we look at it from our net flows. If we look at it from the pure inflows, something close to about 13x in terms of total difference. So by and large, we're still, even if we assume that the ETFs are in fact the only reason that the Bitcoin market cap has gone up this year, then we're still not even close to our 118x estimate. So really, we're starting to, to kind of narrow in and say, well, you know, at, at a best case scenario, if we imagine that the rest of the Bitcoin market doesn't exist, ETFs are the only game in town, then we're talking about a multiplier of about 32x, 33x, right? Um, or more correctly, right, probably something in the order of 10x or thereabouts. So again, we're, we're really struggling to get this 118x number, um, and even 50x just doesn't quite make sense in this context. Now, just to wrap things up in terms of the ETFs, but also to put things into a sense of scale, because I think this is important, we've covered this chart in the past. What this is looking at is the different vectors of demand and supply that we're about to cover. So in the orange, we're looking at the 30-day change, and all of these are a 30-day rolling change, 30-day change in the realized cap. And the realized cap is describing coins that are being revalued higher or lower when it's positive. Obviously, there's realized profits. So when someone buys a coin down here at 20000 and they sell it up here at 70,000, that's realizing a profit. Somebody else has to come in with that extra capital, which creates an uplift in the realized cap. Now notice that the realized cap climbed significantly into our 73K all-time high, and we're still seeing profits being realized, but to a lesser extent. This is essentially what puts tops in. People are realizing too much profit that it overwhelms the inflowing demand. So who is the actual seller of those coins? Well, that's what we're looking at down the bottom here. This is our 30-day change in long-term holder supply. So long-term holders took profits on the way higher. And if we put these uh, next to each other, 80 billion a month in net profit taking. And if we look at long-term holders, they were selling about $57 billion worth, right? So we're talking about something on the order of 57 to 80 billion of net capital inflows required to keep the market going because otherwise that supply will overwhelm the demand. Now, if we look at the green, this is that uh, the ETF inflows. If we pretend that GBTC doesn't exist, here we're looking at net inflows into the ETFs. And at the peak, we're talking about 16 billion. So out of the 80 billion, 16 of it was the ETFs. The rest is just the good old fashioned hodler market, what's going on in spot markets. Likewise, on the sell side, there were lots of claims that GBTC was the only thing driving it and that we have to factor out all of our long-term spending for GBTC. Well, out of the 57 billion a month, about 7.9 of it was GBTC. So it's big. The ETFs are significant. They're non-trivial. We don't have to squint as hard to see the issuance down here in purple, but they are not the only game in town. And what that also tells us, if we really want to get an estimate for demand, we should probably have a look at what's going on with the long-term holders and what's going on with realized profit and loss to really get into the realized cap. So looking at long-term holders, what we've done here, and I'm just gonna put myself up here because I know I'm gonna cover something up eventually. If we look at things for the long-term holders, I've got two traces shown here. What we're doing is just a very, very simple and crude assumption. Every single long-term holder spent coin, let's just imagine that that's sell-side pressure. Now, why do we care about a number like this? Well. For every seller, there's a buyer. So if these long-term holder coins are being spent and sold, taking profits, taking chips off the table, then somebody else has to come in and buy those coins. And really, if we want to estimate demand, we can do so by looking at, well, what is the amount of supply? And again, we're not trying to get to perfect numbers here. We're trying to get a decent ballpark to see whether 118x is a reasonable number in the first place. So if we look at most of 2023, 
typical long-term holder sell side was five, six, something odd billion dollars per month, right? This is a rolling 30-day change. As we came into the ETFs at the start of this year, that spending ramped up quite significantly to about $22 billion a month. So some people sold the news and we did actually get a correction down about 38K, but then they sold the rally. This is that profit taking that we just looked at in the previous chart, up to $50 billion a month in long-term holder sell side that quite literally established the top. So if all of these coins are being sold, and again, GBTC will be some factor of these down the bottom here. If we imagine that all these coins are being sold, the purple line since FTX blew up, and this is by the way, for all of the charts we're about to cover, they will be tracked from when FTX blew up because this is our bull market to date. And with the question we're trying to answer, how much capital needs to flow into Bitcoin to take us from it's over at 15.7K to it's not over at new all-time highs? What kind of capital inflow do we need over that period? And in terms of long-term holder sell side, about $148 billion. So that means that if we price every long-term supply, every single coin at the time when it was spent, then we needed $148 billion to take the market cap from it's over to all-time high. Right, So it's giving us a bit of a, an estimate. And again, we've got a couple of these different methods. We're just trying to hone in on what is a reasonable estimate because then we can compare that to that market cap change and try and assess how much is actually flowing in. Now, the other component here is looking at it from the perspective of realized profit. Now, when, when we look at realized profit, these are coins that were acquired cheap being sold at a higher price. Right, So when you have someone who buys a coin at 20,000 or 15,000 and then sells it up here at 60, somebody else has to come in with that delta in price, this realized value, the coins transferring from a low cost basis to a high cost basis requires somebody to come in with more money to buy the same amount of coin. And what we can see is that as we rallied higher, remember this is when the long-term supply started really decreasing, or in this case, they were spending it. Notice how much realized profit was getting locked in. Now, this is realized profit by short-term holders and long-term holders. And in total, we're talking about about $231 billion since the FTX collapse. Now, 60-odd percent of that happened after the ETFs went live. And this is kind of that profit-taking that new demand is coming in from the ETFs and some of, it, some of those long-term coins, no question, migrated from a hodler into an ETF and then you know, to, into those ETF shares. If we compare this between short-term holders and long-term holders, about 120 billion from long-term, 110 from short-term, so it's roughly 50-50. So not only are the long-term holders selling, but so are the short-term holders, buying low, selling high, buying low, selling high. There's obviously losses along the way, we'll touch on that in a second. But by and large, let's just do a big picture demand estimate, about 231 billion in net profit has been taken since FTX collapsed. So within the, the scope of this bull market, we're getting to a bit of an upper bound estimate of demand, about 230 odd billion. Now, both of those are shown in the green here. This is our realized profit. Let's go down here to the realized loss, about 81 billion. How on earth do you lock in a realized loss, $81 billion worth of loss, no less, during a bull market? Well, that's because on the left-hand side, not shown in this chart, are all the unfortunate souls who bought during the 2021 and 22 bear cycle, held those coins, survived the bear, and then sold on the way up to still lock in some kind of a loss. Now, there's a few other ways that we can get realized losses. There's people who buy locally high and then sell locally low. They think that they're getting a good price, market sells off, and ultimately they capitulate at the local lows and the market rallies again, they buy high again, and they sell low again, and then away we go. And we can see that realized losses ticked up from about 69 billion up to 81. Um, following this correction. So people who did buy high are now selling low, right? as is par for the course. So if we take out $231 billion, we've got a lower bound estimate, long-term supply, it's about 150 billion. We've got our profit taking only about 231 billion. But in theory, someone's got to come in and buy those coins at a loss too. So there's another 81 billion. So our upper bound estimate, if we add profit and loss together, is about 312 billion. So again, we're just trying to get a bit of a ballpark. Now, of course, there's a two x multiple between 150 billion long-term selling and the profit and loss, which is about 312 billion. But we're starting to bound the problem for how much demand flows in, and as a result, we can then calculate what a reasonable multiplier would look like. Now, there is no question 
that there is a multiplier effect. I, I don't think there's much debate on that because what we're looking at here, that previous chart, I told you we're going to start from small all the way up. Well, here's our ETFs in the small. Here's our long-term supply and our realized cap change, which is actually profit minus loss. And these are both in there around 150, 160 billion. If we take our profit plus loss, here's our 320 billion. And all of this, no matter which one we want to choose, has created an enormous market cap change of $955 billion. That number alone is astounding and extraordinary. Since the FTX bottom to where we are today, Bitcoin has added $955 billion in market cap. At the peak, it was over $1.13 trillion. So serious, serious numbers. And you can see this is obviously somewhere in the order of three to five X, depending on which estimate we want to use that has created this kind of an effect. Of course, we can't compare directly to the ETFs because they only started here, which is why we did that first chart looking from the start of the year. So that's where we're going to leave part one, really exploring the fact that there is a multiplier effect. We've got some pretty substantial um, estimates of what the demand inflows can be, right? Up to uh, 320, but you know, best estimate, probably around 150, 160 billion. And that has created a overall market cap change of 955 billion. So again, multiplier somewhere in the order of about three to five X, that's pretty different to the 118X. It's pretty different to 50X. It's pretty different to 10X. So really, it's a lot more grounded. When we just look at things in terms of real demand and capital inflows, um, to me, at the very least, I think we can comfortably dispel numbers north of 20X um, in terms of a multiplier. I think it's very, I would love to see the calculations for how we get there because um, I've not been able to get those numbers work. So what we're going to do now is move on to part two and spend some time looking at the oscillator. Um, and really, this is a very interesting tool because it helps us identify periods of supply shortage, which we typically see in the lead up to bull, bull markets and uptrends, but then also periods of supply overhang where that shifts over and we start to move into a regime where things are not so great. Let's get stuck into it. So thanks, folks, for tuning in for part one of our weekly analysis. If you enjoyed the video and you want access to the full video and the rest of our analysis, do head over to our Substack and hit subscribe. As a paying member, you'll actually get access to a second piece of analysis each week, as well as the comment section where you can ask me questions and we'll answer them in a Q&A on a regular basis. So thank you so much for all of your support. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers.